Great. Um, thanks. All right. Um, so thanks for the invitation uh, from Quinfeng. Uh, I think we kind of overlap a lot uh, when I was back in HKUSD and also thank uh, all the audiences and the faculties uh, from Minnesota to give me the chance um, to introduce uh, such idea presented in the following two works uh, done with this lovely uh, collaboration uh, from HQST people, uh, including Professor Tao Liu, uh, Professor uh, Henry, Henry Tai, and uh, uh, they're like uh, three student, very uh, talented young men. So the, the talk would be about, uh, as the title says, Exe Hicks Cosmology, though it would be vague what that means. So uh, I would explain a little bit just by saying it's a varying Higgs back in cosmology, say just what would happen if uh, it's no longer a constant that we know. Of course, it changes. It could change slightly. We know that in the very early, early universe, uh, it changes, um, but but not in a way that, uh, you know, causing cosmology very different. I mean, you know, just in many ways. And then I'm going to introduce you a axionic solution. So. There will be two parts. First of all, is the the Higgs part, um, and then the next one would be the axi axi part. Okay, talking about the axions. Of course, nowadays people have like a very low standard. Uh, well, any axion-like particles, uh, sometimes called axions, like say ultralight axions, though like they are not really axion. But I will just interchangeably use these two terms because uh, there, there would be no ambiguation. So we'll start. Um, I, the, because this is a long talk and I want to just relax a little bit, I would start with our like uh, the motivation of doing such a work. Um, just what what kind of uh, tensions within data? Okay, if lambda CDM fail to explain well some extraordinary um, data, and also I'm gonna give you a quick review of the idea. So this would be done in probably ten minutes. So if you are like say just already hungry, just ready for lunch. Um, you can leave after that point. If you are still interested, then I will just talk more about the details and the interesting point about, first of all, the Higgs part. So what if Higgs changes, of course, it would have impact on uh, CMB and potentially other cosmological uh, observations. Uh, and also before CMB, there's like another uh, source and the, probably the earliest uh, knowledge we can like solidly infer from uh, the thermal history of the universe, which is a Big Bang nuclear synthesis, a BBN. And afterwards, we, I would show that how it managed to resolve some of the problems and then uh, introduce uh, what if an axion is involved. Okay, axion is introduced to um, fix the problem, uh, introduce the changing Higgs path, um, and also other remaining problems uh, I, I would uh, just, which I I would introduce serve as a motivation and the, some observational um, constraints up to date and then summarize. So let's begin with um, Hubble tension. So as Quin Fung uh, like introduces, this is one of the uh, primary motivation uh, for this work. Um, it's, it's kind of popular right now, uh, though there right here must be a lot of experts uh, knowing this very well, or like they're already working on that, but since there could be students, so I would just like uh, explain like in pace. So we we have um, the Hubble parameter measurements, like it started like uh, many decades ago. And nowadays um, we somehow narrowed down because previously uh, in, in, in many years ago, there's like two major branches of the measurement and uh, then uh, nowadays they kind of merge together. But even nowadays we have our own problem um, just seen in this plot. So from the early universe uh, measurements, of course, this is like a combined with some other bunch of uh, measurement. It's just, it's, it's not Planck only or it's non-trivial. But from this Lambda CDM, it's just a, this, I would say, this is a, a model dependent result. Uh, it's a smaller number. So you can say uh, the standard best fit is around 67 or below 68 uh, kilometer per second per megaparsec. So that's how uh, from the CMB, we know our universe expands. On the other hand, um, there's other measurements from late time universe, um, which is uh, 
claim to be less model dependent because it measures um, objects, for example, supernovae or like say uh, distant galaxies using, uh, you know, uh, some kind of uh, standard ladder of astrophysics or cosmology. And we know the distance, we know the luminosity of these objects, and we can infer how fast universe expands. And then from these late time measurements, uh, you can see a whole bunch of them. And I would say, except those uh, uh, TR, uh, TRGB, uh, the, the, the red giant uh, measurements, the remaining measurements somehow uh, converge, well, at least at some point greater than 72, uh, you know, the, the Hubble value. And the uh, uh, depends on which parameter set you take, um, the discrepancy could be large as like four to five sigma. So clearly, um, this draws a lot of tension uh, recently. And a perfect solution, I would say, uh, has yet to come. So I, I'm not claiming this uh, talk. In this talk, I will introduce you the perfect solution. This is just, uh, but I think would be shed light on the real solution and also uh, point out, point away out from uh, Lambda CDM. So here's another long-standing problem, and this uh, numerically can be more striking, which is the long-standing uh, lithium-7 problem. So if you, uh, just, just in, in a word, the lithium uh, primordial abundance uh, measured by this ratio, of course, it's extremely low. Uh, but nowadays, the measured value is around um, well, 16, uh, what, or 1.6 times uh, 10 to the minus 10, so we, which is I I indicated by this green band. On the other hand, uh, this uh, blue contour here um, is the theoretical prediction. And you can see it's like, of course, per, like uh, it's a function of like parameters such as eta, which is the uh, baryon to photon ratio, but that's, that's the nuisance. So given that we have a very good measurement of our universe today and the, the theoretical uncertainties of nuclear physics, because we can do a bunch of experiments um, to like figure out each process uh, separately, uh, the, the theoretical uncertainty is actually quite low and uh, the central value pointing at 5.6. And here's a huge discrepancy. We cannot imagine our universe is sitting in this region because it basically contradicts everything uh, we have observed. So this three times difference or numerically you can translate it to a nine sigma uh, uh, discrepancy uh, is like so-called the lithium problem and that uh, um, within lambda cdm without introducing uh, new ideas uh, it there's like hardly uh, good ways to, to solve it you can do it but the, they more or less call for some new elements uh, beyond the lambda cdm sorry uh, could i ask a question about that yes. because uh how do we know that the observations measure the primordial lithium? Because I would say that's a huge source of error, right? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So I'm not the expert of astrophysics. Um, I can, what I can tell is the, we can, well, at least so far, we are not actually observing the primordial uh, lithium abundance because you, you don't really know. Um, the, the method is actually to measure them in stars, but those are very, like say very light, very red stars that the nuclear activities are so gentle that they are believed not moving or like say, you know, just uh, treating lithium seven well. So we can still observe this uh, very well. But um, there are like a lot of debates, but uh, um, as far as I know, it is very hard for uh, astrophysics uh, processes that, that reduces uh, the, the, the abundance by a factor of three. There could be possibilities. Uh, here, I'm taking an agnostic way, taking these numbers uh, just for granted. Uh, if it would be Actually, good if there are. It's probably most likely that it is destroyed in stars. That's probably really what's happening. Um, to answer Tony's question, mm -hmm. um, I mean, we always thought that the, the observations would uh, appear to be primordial, uh, but there's less and less evidence for that is that uh, the so-called lithium plateau is not so much a plateau anymore. And so, uh, and people doing work on, <clears throat> on, uh, uh, on, on stars are finding more and more that they can reproduce the primordial value, um, uh, sorry, the observed value from starting with a primordial value using the, um, the destruction. So um, 
this is sort of the standard picture that there's this this problem and uh, and it's true we don't know for sure if astrophysics is the solution but if i had to guess right now it, it probably is well, the, the main reasons for which we thought that this was the primordial abundance are, are slowly disappearing i see well, it, it's, not, it's not like the speed plateau becomes uh, um, non-valid, right? Uh, it's just uh, question, the question is whether you can reduce it using astrophysics by a factor of three without introducing a huge scale. Well, it's more than that. The plateau doesn't seem to extend to very low metallicity anymore which yeah which which has somewhat special stars so no not really i mean you look the more and more observations are showing a, a lot of dispersion the, well the, okay so what's what causes the 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 drop below minus three well but even even above minus three they're starting to see stars with lower uh what you don't okay. see too much is anything going above. So there's a okay. minimum amount of destruction. Okay. Okay. That that the, if if uh, what you what you're saying is that uh, recent observations, if I can interpret your statements, increase the dispersion along the speed plateau. That's then, right. Then, then then it goes towards the that it's not primordial. I agree. Yes. Yeah. And and the other thing that. Uh, people used as evidence for the primordial was that uh, there were some observations of lithium-6. And if lithium-6 um, is seen, that means that lithium-6 shouldn't have been destroyed. And if lithium-6 isn't destroyed, lithium-7 shouldn't be destroyed. But all of those observations are pretty much oh, gone. Lithium-6 yeah. is garbage. Uh, yeah, that's no... Well, the, most of them were garbage, but there were still a few hanging on and even those now appear to have been uh, shown to be false. So it seems for sure that lithium-6 is destroyed, which makes it much more likely that lithium-7 is also well, destroyed. You, you don't have primordial lithium-6, but you have cosmic ray lithium-6. Is that what you, what you mean? Yes. Okay. But what's observed now, the upper limits are far below what you even expect from cosmic rays. Ah, okay, okay, that's that's relevant. Okay, yeah, we're actually yeah. writing that up now. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, right. thanks, Katie. Yeah, thanks. So may I proceed right now? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Ahead. Great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. 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 So so as yeah so right now we hear the debate. All right. So which is great. So we, I'm here not to point out. Okay, this is like say, the sole solution and. Uh, um, there's still something we can do about that because like say, okay, all of these, uh, well, I mean, studies are non-trivial and that you can, people have like different opinions, um, even though the stars are destroying lithium or like they have some kind of, uh, I would say non-trivial transitions between its core and the, the surface, uh, it just would be still nice, okay, to understand how it goes and, uh, well, maybe uh, extrapolated value is not exactly the theoretical produced, uh, predicted. Um, so uh, I would not uh, just over expand in this point, but uh, later I will uh, explain our ideas how to solve. It. Here I'm just taking the reported numbers that people take as a as a as a as an example or, or input. All right. So there are uh, beyond that, um, there are like less um, significant tensions. So they are also drawing attentions recently, but not uh, as strong as the previous two. So which is uh, one of them is a so-called uh, sigma eight or SA tension. So SA is just another uh, way to parameterize sigma eight. It's basically uh, the matter power spectrum uh, amplitude around eight, like an eight inverse megaparsec scale, or like say the volume of uh, ten to the fourteen solar mass uh, that that you know contain that uh, that that many material. So uh, from from different measurements, you can you can do uh, for example, you extrapolate from uh, lambda CDM, uh, you know, uh, from from the from data from CMB, and uh, this predicts or gives you a larger prediction as shown in in this plot or or right here. Of course, it may fluctuate a little bit. Um, there are other measurements, for example, just using, like, say, visible object. Okay, so pointing at the different galaxies, do a lot of statistics. Okay, there could be um, clustering. There could be like weak lensing measurements um, from different measurements, but nowadays they're landing on on a lower value. Uh, and uh, 
of course, this could be or should be understood uh, together on the plane of SA and uh, uh, omega m because they're correlated. But you can see there are some tensions between uh, Planck and uh, the Dirac uh, or late time measurements. The, the point is, if we have solutions and the many solutions in, uh, like say, if we want to introduce as a remedy for Hubble tension, uh, they actually would make this uh, sigma eight worse. So it would be uh, important uh, to figure out ways to uh, soothe the problem without just like say, trading, trading sigma here and there. And at the last, um, this is like maybe more interesting and it could be more controversial. So at this point, I will just like take it as an indicator. Okay, what if this happens? So the idea is the non-zero uh, isotropic cosmic bifringence effect. Uh, basically, um, the every photon uh, from the CMP travel to our planet, the, the polarization plane has been rotated by a uniform uh, beta angle, uh, as indicated in this uh, in this plot. So uh, this will introduce some kind of uh, parity violating uh, B mode, uh, which can be checked in the cross relation between the E mode and the B mode. Uh, there could be a lot of systematics. And only recently, uh, the group, uh, uh, they are kind of like doing the, the smart game, okay, using different bands, uh, and also the, the correlation with different bands to cancel the large systematics and come to the conclusion that beta is a non-zero angle. Uh, it's 2.5 sigma from zero. So it would be in interesting uh, if if there are like uh, potential solutions to that, so that all these uh, four pieces uh, summed up uh, to be uh, one or the what our uh, model trying to solve. This is a vanilla model, but uh, in some sense it works pretty well. So let's make the the long story short. Um, I'm just introduce what if a Higgs is changing. So one of the key observation and the, which is already available or somehow pointed out. Uh, in the previous, uh, sorry, previous Planck analysis is that if the electron mass is no longer just its nowadays values, if the electron mass is heavier, of course, equivalently or semi-equivalently, uh, you can change the elect uh, electric coupling constant alpha. Uh, but let's take electron mass for granted here. So if it's heavier, then, uh, well, I mean, back then, uh, the redshift uh, 1100, uh, when the recombination happens, this can largely resolve the Hubble tension uh, by the mechanism uh, because the heavier electron mass would just leave you an early uh, done recombination. And therefore, this serves as a, a shrinking uh, sound horizon solution to the Hubble tension. Um, I, I have a question. Um, yes. The uh, If you're changing the electron mass, how when does it become equal to its, is it continuously changing or does it suddenly yeah, It's change? continuously changing uh, because you are, we are using the axion or ALP to change it. Uh, actually you can solve as a function of time. So it drops, uh, right now, the, the more likely picture is that it drops at some point uh, during the dark age or just like some, somewhere in between that you have no good observations. Uh, so uh, we have analyzed that uh, it is possible. Well, I, I guess my question is, you know, once, well, I guess there's two parts of the question because you're doing this after, um, around the time of recombination. So how yes. different is it very early on, say, you know, the time of nucleosynthesis? Uh, it then... would be around the same order of magnitude. That's uh, an assumption. It n not have to be, but from our model, it, uh, it's just more or less like that. Okay, and then um, then then you also have constraints um, from things like quasar absorption systems at your know, redshift of three. Uh, yes, I'm gonna mention that uh, okay. just like in this part. Yeah, okay. but uh, I will show later that this is not the most con uh, stringent constraint that we would have nowadays. Okay. Okay, great. So um, on the other hand, a larger VAV, uh, because we change electron mass and the uh, if we believe in Higgs mechanism, then we also change the quark mass. And uh, this would uh, also bring you, of course, together with all the parameter uh, differences, but the, for BBN, that's the most uh, striking one. So it also can greatly reduce the lithium uh, to uh, uh, hydrogen ratio. So it depends on your, your point of view. And uh, even like astrophysics can explain, okay, a big chunk of 
uh, the the discrepancy, uh, it does not contradict that. Okay, it is less than the prediction or theoretical prediction we have right now. Um, so let, let's wait until uh, astrophysicists review more data. Um, in order to do so, there, there were many ways, uh, as just pointed out uh, by my audience. Uh, this could be done, uh, and that eventually this number must fall down. Okay, just from 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 the uh, recombination value, it could be just a slowly changing field that doing it semi continuously. Um, it it drops uh, suddenly after uh, the recombination uh, finishes, or you can imagine a uh, set of some low scale phase transition moving the Higgs path a teeny tiny little bit uh, by one per uh, order one percent. Uh, and it happens between uh, just like uh, these two, roughly speaking, uh, these two redshift. So we have no very stringent constraints there. So here we choose to use the slowly changing field, which is a um, ALP or axionic field. Um, there are a few statements I can make right now because uh, right nowadays people treat uh, axion uh, mass as a free input or, or just the free parameter, because uh, there are ways that you can imagine in, in uh, some very clever theory, they can emerge uh, at very light mass. So you can introduce this uh, time scale, which is corresponding to recombination easily by putting a mass by hand. It, it also suppresses structure formation, so which is the answer to the sigma A tension, or at least it, it stops it from uh, being much worse. Um, on the other hand, uh, we also, uh, Axion, uh, in general, if it has something to do, uh, couples with standard model, then in general, you can just uh, wake up the, the coupling to the electric magnetic field, uh, and it introduces a non-zero ICB, because from standard model side, this is a, a CPR coupling. Uh, in... Sorry, <clears throat> why, yes. why does the light field suppress the structure formation? Um, because the... Um, it's just the quantum pressure if you treat it as an effective fluid. So it tends to like uh, smooth out all the smaller stru the structures like a, or technically uh, like I say, uh, suppress all the structure formation below the gene scale. Uh, this is like a kind of a standard. Uh, you can imagine, for example, uh, in, in, our uh, in our galaxy, for example, the fuzzy dark matter uh, solutions uh, to avoid the core cusp problem, uh, the fuzzy dark matter just forms solitonic core around a kiloparsec scale. So the further um, structural formation below that scale is somehow suppressed. Of course, this is not a very good metaphor, but, but you, you get the idea. Um, uh -huh. so you're and the people that... work on that uh, very uh, straightforwardly, and that there are packages like Axion Camp that you can actually solve the, the, the result. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you're assuming that the axon field is non-relativistic, non right? Uh, yes, because we have, uh, in our setup, we somehow have a, somehow a misalignment mechanism. Um, so if it's a relativistic, then it's a different story. Yeah, but uh, here we are treating that as an effective or just like a field and the effective fluid. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Sorry, could I also ask a question? Yes. You said before that you want to change the electron mass, but you could yes. change the Yukawa coupling and not necessarily the VEV. Yes. So you, you, you want to change the VEV because you can end up solving more problems. Is that the idea? Um, yes, uh, and uh, there are... It is also true that uh, moving Yukawas is a little bit uh, less straightforward than moving that in our point of view. Uh, though, you know, why is that? Uh, because right here you can have, like, say, dynamic solutions of the Higgs VEV, while the Yukawas, you need to know what it's coming from. Um, I see. So you're gonna, so you're gonna, you're gonna present a model later on that will show us how the VEV is changing, and that's yeah, easy because for it's you just like construct. a move. Yeah, the axion is going to do that, yeah. But of course, principle... you can also introduce, for example, just Yukawa changes and the, all the leptons and the quarks are changing in a certain manner. Uh, that's also been done uh, previously. Uh, here we find uh, somehow it is more elegant or simple, straightforward to just move the Higgs map. And uh, it's understandable, yeah. Because okay, Higgs thanks. map do move uh, as... Uh, the temperature changes, of course, not not the the way that we, we mentioned. Mm -hmm. Great, okay, thanks. Yep. 
So for CMB, oh, let's uh, talk about a little bit more about the CMB uh, and uh, just the, how the recombination works. Um, there, it, it's actually very complicated. People spent like say decades develop the theory, um, and uh, there are numerous details I can or I'm not going to, uh, but uh, uh, in, in principle we can find in the references. Uh, the very simplified picture is that uh, it's a bunch of like ionized gas, and then as temperature decreases, right? I mean, universe expands, uh, then they try to fall like say neutral hydrogen, hydrogen and uh, therefore it, the universe become transparent again. Uh, and the CMB photon can, can reach, uh, reach to uh, Earth like nowadays. So the, the simplified picture is that uh, because at that moment, the collisions are still uh, frequent. Um, so for hydrogen, actually the ground state and the two excited states themselves uh, within like a approximate thermal equilibrium. So we can treat that as a whole. And uh, therefore these like a three, three days, st three state system is in like a coupling with the, like a particle physics uh, um, field. Like say you have free electrons, you have protons and the gammas um, together. And you can see uh, that uh, because you have like, a, for example, the transition between the continuum or the capturing uh, and the drops to, uh, the one S state would uh, like uh, ex just I introduce immediate reabsorption. So this one is not very effective uh, in terms of recombination. So instead, it would be determined by uh, the two S and two P states uh, capturing uh, um, electrons, or like say forming these excited states. But the more importantly, it's the cross section, right? It's the, the capturing rate, and uh, there are details, of course. But in a hand wavy way from dimension analysis, uh, this is described by the cross-section, right? E plus P uh, to H plus. And the cross-section is described by the area. And the, the only thing that can govern that area, like say the characteristic scale, uh, would be just the ball radius of hydrogen, right? Uh, it could be more constant because it's excited state, but if you change the electron mass, it, effectively just shrinks the ball, uh, the, the ball radius. And therefore the cross-section, the interaction rate um, just reduce. And you have the process freeze out earlier because you have smaller cross-section must be done uh, at early, early age when you compare the rate with Hubble. So here is a more detailed simulation or just exemplify uh, using this, uh, uh, say, uh, well, smart package, right? a lot of details involved. And indeed we see uh, the recombination process. Okay, this is basically something like a derivative, okay. Uh, describing the capturing of electron and the, where it's maximum, it somehow tells you the recombination is uh, done or, or, or uh, it's a characteristic time scale Z star. So as electron mass goes up, um, this was like a push uh, to a higher redshift or it's done uh, earlier. Or you can find it in this table of, uh, say, log log dependence. So you can see that uh, Z star, or like say, uh, the, the time scale, uh, the redshift for recombination, and also the, the drag scale, uh, which is also uh, closely related to each other, uh, th they are just uh, proportional uh, in the vicinity of like uh, some perturbation, uh, proportional to the VAF change. Uh, and also, of course, depend on like other parameters, but that's not not the key. So you have, uh, well, you have an early recombination and how this resolves the problem. Uh, so this go back to the angular sound horizon measurement, which is the theta star, which can be inferred from, uh, for example, the differences between each peaks uh, in the, or the acoustic peaks in the CMB measurement. This is so far, I think one of the most precise measurements you can get from CMB and nobody wants to violate that. So let's say it fixes at a certain, uh, a certain ratio. And then we kind of trying to figure out, okay, how many uh, mass like, uh, or, or matter, how many uh, dark, uh, dark energy I know to put in our universe and just trying to do the fit. Um, so it turns out that the sound horizon, uh, which is like an integration uh, from, uh, Z star to infinity uh, would, the, would be highly sensitive, okay, to a changing Z star because it's just increasing Z star just have reduced range of integration. And therefore, uh, even you fix all the parameters there, uh, it somehow shrinks 
On the other hand, the D star is like not very sensitive because it's dominated by uh, the late time expanding where the Hubble is like much lower. So if you fix everything, uh, then R star reduces and theta star uh, is not going to kept the same. So uh, from the standard picture, one of the remedy is to put in more uh, dark energy uh, because dark energy would not affect the, basically not affect the R star, but D star would be uh, because it's late time expanding. Uh, so it would be sensitive to that. So uh, R star uh, is sensitive to Z star and the D star is not, then we can compensate by a larger cosmological constant. And therefore, which is, is this is the way that we can reach a higher Hubble uh, in, in a nutshell. Uh, more technically, uh, we decided to uh, fit the two parameters, for example, the R drag, the, the, the drag scale and the H uh, from the BAO measurement. It could be more complicated than that, but let's, uh, this is just an example, uh, just a, a heuristic uh, example. So we fixed this, we fixed the theta star the angular scale to, to the CMP value, and that this is uh, what we have. So this is a Gaussian approximation, by the way. So this is a, what, where the CMP goes, and the, you, you can see that in, in terms of Hubble-wise, because we, at this point, we don't have a very good uh, prior on what delta V, just a VEV change would be. So if the delta V is higher, uh, then it, the, the average goes higher uh, right here. And if it's lower, the, if it's 1%, it can still raise the Hubble or the fitted Hubble would be 69 instead of 67. In the meantime, we also find that uh, in order to balance, for example, uh, other effects, the dark matter um, fraction, okay, omega C or just capital omega C would also increase uh, because of the effect. So the, okay, so there will be more details, uh, depends on if you are interested in, uh, but in order, because we have only two constraints and there are so many parameters to, to, uh, to, to deal with. So instead, uh, we are introducing more constraints from the CMB uh, and uh, BAO measurement just to better just uh, capture the key, as the, the essence of these measurements, though they're highly, uh, dimensionful, uh, so this may not be exact, but so far as what we know, they are kind of satisfactory compared to the full analysis. And it is good for uh, you know, theoretical calculation and understanding. So we, aside from the two parameters, we also decided to land on uh, the Hubble horizon at the matter radiation equality, uh, the damping scale, uh, which can be uh, analytically or semi-analytically uh, solved, the BAO scales, uh, which, uh, in terms of three, the, this is a universal, this is uh, the parallel and the perpendicular ones, but basically are different observations uh, at uh, different Z scales. We have like several data points from the past, uh, rather it would be better than uh, this like a single point, uh, but that's, uh, that's up to you. Uh, later, um, as an update, which is not on our archive yet, so to make the study more authentic, we also include the CMP lensing spectrum uh, inferred SL, which is another parameterization of sigma eight. And that this is like a part of the uh, reason you can see a different uh, measurement right here. So that's what, uh, or you can claim that's what CMB is actually uh, constraining in, in terms of sigma eight problem. And once you have included these, uh, we find it, it's in good accordance with the previous result. If you just raise electron mass, okay, this is an electron mass only model. And you can see from the full fledged analysis and our uh, Gaussian or linear approximation, uh, aside from small non Gaussianity, they fit um, quite well. It also fits with uh, like lambda CDM result, uh, but that's more trivial. So, um, let, let's take this granted uh, for now. Okay, this is the one of the ways that you can increase the Hubble, okay? Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about uh, BBN. Um, okay, so it's very good to know there are a lot of experts around. So uh, I, I am okay if you pointed out some, some things are wrong, but hopefully uh, I will present some general ideas rather than uh, something could, be, uh, could go wild. So the BBN is uh, just, First of all, people talk about he, uh, helium, and then uh, you you need to talk about neutron because the measurement is like more precise right now, and uh, lithium seven, and uh, also uh, like say triton, etc. So 
heuristically, the the ratio could be uh, just in 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 measured this way, or the this is the very beginning of BBN. Uh, because everything, every neutron just goes to helium. So you can solve BBN by solving the uh, neutron fraction uh, using this uh, equation. So it's very simple. It, it's like, say, these two parts. First of all, it's describing the um, transition uh, bit or conversion between neutron and the proton or neutron decays. Uh, could be neutrinos involved. Uh, and the second term is uh, describing uh, neutron decay. All right, just solely after the freeze out. So this one, uh, of course, this is like some temperature, this is a Boltzmann equation, so it tells you, okay, the, uh, like a before or after, just right after the freeze out, uh, just proton and neutron numbers are just uh, fixed themselves. Uh, what's the ratio? This is like around one to six. And then uh, afterwards, the, the universe, uh, experience some time that's freely, uh, there's like no deuteron effectively produced before the so-called deuteron bottleneck. Uh, this, uh, so neutron would keep decay uh, and eventually just becomes like a stable deuteron. And this eventually fixes the uh, nowadays uh, neutron to proton ratio largely. So this would introduce another factor of six over seven. So uh, roughly speaking, this is one over seven. and. Uh, Turns out it matches our uh, observed helium fraction. So what if we have changed the parameters? Of course, this is highly non-trivial, and the theoretical uncertainty could be uh, quite large because uh, you, we cannot change parameters by ourselves. Okay, it can only be done in theory, and we know that that's where the, the you know just all the subtleties lies within. But we can still figure out what could happen. Um, so first of all, because this is an electroweak process, um, so it's certainly all the electroweak parameters that changes would affect, for example, uh, the Fermi constant or effectively the W boson mass with the change, uh, this basically affects the uh, only relevant electroweak steps right here. Uh, it could also change the electron mass and also the isospring breaking, uh, more or less working on this side. And more importantly, the, uh, as uh, widely accepted or as a convention, uh, this average like quark mass, uh, here we take the up and down because they're just the only relevant ones here. It also significantly influences the nuclear interactions because that's these are just uh, determines or determines the, at the end of the very complicated network. This is a simplified, greatly simplified picture. Apologize for that, um, the, the lithium abundance. So, uh, there could be a lot of details, and the, the, the best way to go is to ask uh, experts, okay, or those experts written packages uh, and put in the theoretical results and extrapolate from uh, what it is. But we can still have a qualitative understanding of what's going on uh, if we increase M quark. So according to the chiral perturbation theory, uh, the pi M mass, which is the uh, messenger between the nucleons, are proportional to the quark mass uh, square root. So heavy, heavy MQ would certainly make M pi heavier. And the heavier M pi as a just a mediator, uh, a heavy mediator make the, uh, the forces like even uh, short range. So it makes the nuclei less bounded, especially the heavy nuclei uh, that uh, their bounding is relying more on these pions and uh, their uh, more connections and the less stable. So from this well-known result, and so far, uh, this is like the best we, we could have, and the most of people are still relying on uh, the, the result nowadays. We see that uh, the beryllium-7, uh, which is a major contributor to the lithium-7 uh, abundances nowadays, are more sensitive to the quark mass difference uh, or the quark mass changes, uh, fluctuations from nowadays values, uh, then uh, helium-4 alpha or uh, say helium-3. And the once they make uh, beryllium-7, uh, this process can be greatly stalled uh, because of a heavier quark mass. Uh, it's just less bounded or the binding energy becomes much lower. And, and uh, why, why does it uh, enter? Even if binding energy is less, what, what's, what's stopping this reaction? Uh, the binding energy is like less, so you can just imagine uh, the the balance. Okay, the chemical balance 
okay though this is so like rough there set. is no chemical balance this reaction is out of equilibrium yes uh so you can imagine that uh when you're trying to penetrate through uh the column potential uh the remaining uh kinetic energy uh, would be less in, in this sense or you need a more kinetic energy in order to uh to to make this happen I find it unsatisfactory this explanation, but okay. Uh, we can uh, we can talk about this uh, later, uh, but uh, this is uh, this is so far. I if, think the... if the energy of the gamma is less, then yeah, of course, uh, this reaction goes as uh, proportional to omega cube uh, of the emitted gamma. Is that the main reason for the for the suppression? Uh, I think qualitatively, this is the this is the best. Best, of course, like it has something to do with uh, the other uh, the other processes. For example, the the order all the remaining uh, processes. But I think uh, from the references and also from from my understanding, this is the key uh, key dependence. So it's not uh, the Coulomb barrier that uh, is changing. It's the frequency of the outgoing gamma that is different is that is that uh, that is the uh, the the reason for the suppression of that reaction yes i think from the calculation uh, they they somehow goes to this solution yeah okay yeah so here we we find okay the results uh, from the previous uh, references you can find them right here the um, bbn parameters uh, as a well i mean or their dependence on these uh, electro either electro weak or strong dynamic parameters so as the uh, cosmological input eta uh, which is the photon to uh, uh, baryon to photon ratio and now it's uh, in our context it's proportional to omega b or the baryon fraction uh, in, in in the fit so uh in order to balance okay just like say it's a trade off so here we just put in our model and ask okay what's the what's the best fit okay so the from in in this regime where the delta v uh, is around 1% and the um the the um the omega b increases by one to three percent it fits the best and uh, in this regime the global uh discrepancy changes for example from uh, from from eight or nine sigma down to around three sigma less than three sigma say so it would be very interesting though uh, if you if the if the uh, previous uh, previous statement is true that if the lithium abundance can be much closer or the theoretical prediction uh, can be, uh, re uh, sorry, the, the observation can be closer to the theory, uh, then you actually can move in this plot, for example, uh, closer to right here and actually having a even better fit. Um, so I think in some sense, it doesn't hurt that much. Of course, it depends on uh, the future developments of the theory. What uncertainty in, in uh... In deuterium, do you assume? Uh, I am using the uh, deuterium. I think it's in. Uh, uh, hold on, it's in the uh, Prisma uh, collaboration that provided. Uh, I think. No, I mean for the observational uncertainty, because as soon as you change anything, mm -hmm. uh, deuterium becomes off. It it becomes off. Even yeah, if I think I used the I used bit, the, the uncertainty is so small now observationally. Yes, I think we use like some of the uh, one of the one of the latest references, uh, which is like around uh, relative uncertainties around one percent. You can check our paper for like say exactly what value we quoted. Um, so I think this is a good point, but uh, I think we just use one of the standard results. Oh, what's what's your prediction uh, uh, for the circle for the uh, uh, helium abundance? Um, the helium abundance is uh, from this circle is uh, around uh, two sigma below the current value. If you want to have a best global fit, uh, well, you know what sigmas are. There is a subject of debate. What's your value for YP? 
Uh, my value of yp is also coming from the same theoretical reference. Uh, I am. Uh, well, no, I'm not... no, you predicted. What, what are you talking about? You, you once you change uh, to that uh, to that ellipse, you you predict what yp is, right? Yes, uh, but you need to start with right. So here is uh, what no, we. Uh, so no, maybe yp I to... is the output of the BBN. What are you talking about? Yes, um, but here because. We are not doing, so here I need to apologize, but we are not doing the full analysis because there are a lot of uh, coding issue and it's like a time constraint. So uh, actual strategy is we're starting from a theoretical a, a theoretical prediction first. So we, we kind of uh, uh, just like say the common prediction, okay, it's the standard prediction. And then we put in these perturbations numerically. So what's your prediction for YP? Uh, the YP, I think what we get is the uh, two sigma below. What is uh, your the, sigma for YP then? Uh, the, the observational one uh, that's found in the, you can find in PDG. I don't think you, you quite know what you're talking about. Mm. I, I'm also worried about, is this thickness of this blue line, is that your uncertainty in deuterium? It's the uncertainty of the deuterium extrapolated from uh, the theory that we begin with. Yeah, but the uncertainty in the experiment is much smaller. Um, let's see, experiment. I think we have already taken into the experimental uncertainty here, which is around 1%. What observation, right? I mean, there's no... Well, I mean, you can call this experiment. It's already included. Here, it's just... Uh, I mean, that blue line looks like it's much more than 1%. Uh, because there's like a theoretical uncertainty, I would say. And no, also, but, it's... No, just, but, uh, mm Not, For example, if you look at the just like at this uh, this contour, right? I mean, just like in in this. Uh, of course, these two axes are actually not quite uh, to the scale. So, but if you just like a, to look at the range of uh, the predictions right here, um, you will find it's just like a compatible with the one one percent level uh, theoretical. Uh, sorry, observational uncertainty. Yeah, it, it would be more helpful if you gave the, the actual numbers that you're you're coming up with your what's what's the solution at your best fit value for because as, as maxime said you if you're if you're changing eta and you're changing v you get values you there's you just you have predictions you have a value for lithium you have a value for deuterium you have a value for helium four um with in principle uncertainties and yes. uh, then I should be able to see what those are and can compare them with the with the observations. Yes, um, I I think this is a good point, and I think I can just like uh, if you uh, want, I can just provide it after this talk because the numbers are there. I just like not explicitly reported uh, in in the uh, in our work. Yeah, we somehow reported the global uh, the the global uh, say. Um, sigma or chi squared, rather than rather than individual uh, observations. Yeah, but you know, there's nobody, no, no, no one else can do anything with that. Then, uh, okay, why don't you go ahead, though? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think you, th this is a, a good point, and I think uh, later on I will provide you some of the. Uh, uh, numbers and the, the method methodology that you you get this number is actually uh, quite straightforward. You're just starting from the theoretical point, and you have the slope or the dependence on uh, these parameters, and then you kind of uh, expand it around that uh, theoretical prediction that other people have, and you match them with the, the observation. Um, so let's uh, just make a make a break and then uh, it's time to introduce the the axions uh, or like say what axion is actually doing in our uh, in, in oh, our reference okay. I, sorry just one one other thing i'm just looking 
I, I was looking at your paper. Mm -hmm. um, so you're uh, okay. So I I guess you're maybe for you deuterium is going up. You're starting with a deuterium which is low. Okay, so you're starting in a situation where deuterium is a problem as well. It looks like it's a uh, it's okay. a slightly in tension with the observation. Yeah. Well, except it's not. Uh, I mean, but okay, I, I see what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the theoretical input. And uh, if you have replaced it with a higher central value, then you may also have a larger theoretical uncertainty. Uh, no, no, you don't. It's, no, it, it's okay. Just, just go on. Okay. Go on. Um, so let's begin uh, just the axiom part um, as like we discussed its coupling uh, with the standard model or like say how on earth it can change the, uh, the Higgs potential. So the Higgs potential uh, in standard model, uh, it just, there would be two terms. Um, and the, since we have no very good knowledge about, for example, this dimensional term, uh, which is, could, could be problematic. So uh, let's think, Okay, what, what we can do around it, or like say we just address it with other terms, uh, for example, uh, the axiom terms that it has lost like some non-trivial coupling uh, with this axiom. Um, without introducing an extra scale, so uh, by default, uh, we put the Planck scale uh, downstairs as its decay constant, or like say uh, something closer to the, 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 the scale of its decay constant. So without any fine tuning, um, a term, uh, if this term or either this term uh, changes all the percent level, uh, it also changes the Higgs value by percent level. So that's the uh, idea. So you can imagine uh, here is like some of the ways, for example, uh, to to get this light axioms uh, in, in in for example in the context of string theory. Uh, in in uh, just in in particle physics language, you can imagine, for example, if you have uh, a, a super uh, super potential uh, of this form, uh, you can have uh, the axiom potential if the uh, if the g or k function uh, looks like that. If it's a first uh, first non-trivial term uh, from the cosine uh, from the co uh, from the cosine form of potential, so. The numerical calculation, uh, it can be done uh, with this axion of revolution. And the, since uh, in our case, the axion, uh, the axion value is related there, or it's proportional, uh, the, the change of Higgs VEF is proportional to A squared over uh, some large scale um, squared. So, if so the, the mass of your scalar has to be very finely tuned, right? To these values because it's not protected. So the, the Higgs loop uh, feedbacks to this mass at a much larger level, right? Is that correct? Uh, in some sense, yes. Well, I in every sense, yes. So it's technically, well, the, which the model, you know, like if I uh, include our particle physics lingo would be called technically unnatural. Okay, but that has to be stated, right? So, because, the, if I if I put Higgs in the loop, uh, like integrate out the Higgs, right? Uh, the the natural value for the mass of your scalar would be uh, coupling constant squared times the Higgs wave to the four divided by M Planck squared, something like that, right? And that that is much larger than ten to minus twenty uh, electron volt. Um. I agree. So like in, in general, people have uh, this kind of uh, concern and uh, there could be like two uh, like pseudo ways, pseudo ways out. Of course, this paper, we focus on the phenomenology. So we didn't uh, really write down the solution uh, to this problem. Uh, first of all, it's like you can ask uh, if the vacua can, can just by casting this by so many times, uh, you can uh, uh, just happen to have this light uh, axion uh, just because of, like, say, uh, the statistics. Um, it could also be, or it might be possible, okay, to call for some non-perturbative, uh, uh, non-perturbative 
uh, mechanisms. Uh, therefore, you can have a cutoff which is lower than the electroweak scale. Uh, but he here we are not providing the explicit solution. Here we just like argue that it is not com not completely impossible. And it would be very good, okay, if okay, uh, any audiences can figure out a better way uh, to change uh, this beyond this vanilla model. I would say. Um, so probably we should just move on and see the consequences. Of course, theoretically, this may not be the only solution. And uh, here I'm just showing the example of like, say, what if this happens? Um, so, so the evolution of axion, if you just take that mass as an input, okay, just put it by hand, um, then we know uh, because in order to make it work, uh, it needs to be, uh, say, below three, three times 10 to the minus 29 EV to be exact, because the value of the axia need to stay uh, at its plateau or the uh, Hubble at that moment need to be larger than the axia mass in order to freeze it at a certain level. And afterwards, the evolution of axia uh, begins as the time goes by. And it starts to oscillate uh, in the later universe and uh, just showing this typical behavior A to the, uh, or the energy density goes as uh, like a matter, like say one to the A to the minus three. Uh, and that as the amplitude dampens and the nowadays we observe less, uh, or at least uh, Delta V can be, uh, for example, in, in this uh, 10 to the minus 29 benchmark, uh, the Delta V amplitude is so small that at least uh, in many cases, it's not, not problematic at all. But so basically what I have introduced is the standard and misalignment uh, mechanism of axion, but somehow it's also related to the Higgs path changes. This would also introduce a, a secondary component of dark matter because previously we assumed uh, cold dark matter just for granted. So this secondary um, axionic dark matter uh, would uh, just, uh, be because it's not, it, it could cause some problem, right? Because the, the common, uh, ma lower mass limit for uh, dark matter, uh, just the dominant dark matter would be 10 to the minus 22 EV. So this light uh, axion cannot be uh, the the, all the dark matter, but it still can explain, or if the fraction, uh, just like say the axion dark matter over all matter fraction is less than 1% level, uh, this is achievable uh, if you set the, the K constant of all the Planck uh, uh, Planck mass scale. Uh, this is achievable and also uh, experimentally it is allowed and the, somehow it is beneficial as because it introduced the effect of suppressing uh, uh, structure formation. So here are you uh, so here are you using the full uh, cosine potential or do you use a quadratic approximation to the potential? I think we use the uh, quadratic approximation, but since okay. we are not evol evolving in a extreme uh, condition, say uh, the angle is uh, closer to pi, I think this is uh, a, a good approximation up to our position. I mean, looking at your uh, slide here, A initial is like 3% of FA. So your initial misalignment angle is actually very close to pi, isn't it? Uh, in okay. which sense, uh, I'm not sure where you mentioned that A uh, over, it's so not. The two equations that you have? Right here? Oh, no, uh, the next slide. Uh, the, the slide that will, yeah, here. here. A initial okay. is 3.7, right? FA is yeah. 3.8. Yes. So there are only 0.1 away different, and that's about 3% of FA. Um, so A and the F A, yes, but the, if you if you A want to close to A over F A should be close to pi in order to have like say here is just like say one radians, right? So it is mm -hmm. still below like say pi over two. So oh, you can still use the uh, yeah, and we can we can change it like say if it's necessary, but the later analysis shows it, it not necessary to be. You can make it like say a cosine potential as long mm -hmm. as you are not necessarily go to an extreme solution, uh, then qualitatively this, the, this evolution would be similar. Of course, there will be corrections, yes. Uh -huh. So for, for this benchmark value that you take uh, for A initial and FA, what exactly is X? Is it 0.01? Um, 
which one? Uh, if so if now you they... use the quadratic uh, quadratic approximation, it doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. so here it's just like say to avoid these inconsistencies or like say further nuisances in the simulation. Uh, so we use the quadratic uh, approximation. And the later mm -hmm. analysis shows uh, it is okay uh, for it because you can just increase the constant right here. Uh, so therefore A can be uh, just slightly smaller. I see. And yeah. the other question I have is that uh, in the coupling between your Higgs and the axion, that coupling uh, explicitly breaks the U1 symmetry, right? So the Higgs VEF directly gives the axial mass. Yes, but that's a weak, uh, uh, weak, uh, weak breaking because it's suppressed by M uh, Planck mass uh, to the leading order by two, two powers. But I think this probably comes back to Maxim's comment. I thought. Uh, yes, I think it is. Uh, it is a. It is a. It is a way. Uh, or this is the way to to mention that. But the, in this kind mm -hmm. of potential, uh, if you take this, or, or somehow if the corrections are also taking this form, then you can find a approximately flat direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Or okay. HVU literally takes that. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So it, it in in that sense, uh, in this in this. Okay, of course there will be theoretical, uh, you know, uh, debates. But if you take this literally, uh, then you can find a, a approximate um, flat direction that uh, has the same uh, axial mass. All right. Mm -hmm. So um, once we have done the res uh, evolution, of course we can put in uh, what kind of a cosmological uh, kind of machinery uh, to do the fit. Uh, but before that, um, just like I mentioned, the sigma a tension a little bit. So uh, introducing uh, a delta V equals 1% or just uh, delta electron mass of order 1% uh, during the recombination, uh, like shown by these plot of, for example, model two or model three, they somehow managed to do that. And the, the central value of Hubble is increased. But in another sense, uh, in order to fit the data, such solutions are having a common point is you have to introduce more cold dark matter to balance, the, for example, the peak heights of the of the CMB data. And therefore you have like a more structural formation uh, or the like the uh, just just pile up more data. Uh, therefore sigma A inevitably increases and the, you can see that the tension becomes worse in these data, uh, I mean, in, in these models. So uh, which is pointed out uh, by, by this reference. But the axion, uh, actually the quantum pressure and the potential force uh, could actually suppress um, the, the any structure or like they suppress the matter power spectrum below its gene scale. So uh, this is just an uh, example, okay, just uh, using actual numerical solutions provided by the, the package. Comparing, okay, so if we inject, we're fixing all the parameters and the replacing some of the cold dark matter, uh, this is exaggerating, okay. So uh, by all the percent of axionic dark matter, and you can see effectively uh, the, um, the matter power spectrum gets uh, gets suppressed, and the, here is where it where the suppression satiated, and the, here is the scale where sigma a is defined, and you can see a suppression. So uh, the the sigma a tension can be alleviated uh, if you introduce a finite number. Okay, as shown right here. Okay, if finite x uh, or non-zero uh, axionic dark matter. So we compare uh, just like say do our fit. Um, right here, you're comparing different models. So you can uh, have different, okay, right here is like say the, the time of playing with the data. So you have a bunch of uh, CMB uh, measurements, okay, BAO measurement, you can include, for example, polarization or even lensing uh, uh, results of CMB uh, and some late time measurements uh, together. So this is weak lensing and uh, you do the fit and you can see that in general, it does better than the Lambda CDM. Uh, and the, here is the comparison, of course, uh, not fully just like uh, in, in the same, on the same page, but uh, in other references, we provide a large uh, number of tables that uh, can, can provide you evidence for that. So in general, um, H naught increases uh, clo much closer if you, in even without including late time measurements, uh, you can still uh, approach like say a value of 69 uh, without, uh, supernovae or uh, distance uh, radi uh, distance radio um, uh, measurements. So in order to validate uh, our uh, leading order perturbative approach, um, we also compare 
uh, the, res the, the fitting with the standard Boltzmann analysis using a modified version of uh, CAMP, I think. This is, the, this is work done by one of our collaborators uh, that's doing a lot of numerical work, uh, trying to compare the, like say, linear, or you can make, you can say Gaussian approximation uh, with the full-fledged analysis. The full-fledged analysis, as I've mentioned, uh, including uh, the TT, also the TE and the E spectrum, and also the lensing spectra. And you can see, um, though some of the parameters are fixed because they're not uh, in particular interesting in our context, uh, but the remaining uh, comparison are more or less uh, satisfactory. Okay, so they stay within each other's error bar. Um, so this is one of the, the one of the, the thing that I think is satisfying or like somehow validating our uh, result if you have uh, this exit Higgs model or somehow uh, the change of the Higgs uh, the Higgs VEF effect, the changing of the uh, just um, fundamental constants uh, coexist with an axiom. So uh, before we go to the direct observation here, I'd just like to briefly introduce or just mention this isotropic uh, cosmic bifringence. This is done, or if you have uh, such a coupling, uh, because it couples the Higgs, so uh, naturally you have such a, uh, a coupling uh, of this scale. And as the axion uh, rolls down from its Plato, so rolls down from like say the initial time, which is around recombination, and the nowadays the the number reaches zero. Uh, the axion val field value changes will introduce you a non-zero a beta angle because this is effectively an a times e dot b uh, kind of coupling. It rotates the uh, photon polarization angle, and uh, from uh, just trying to find the cross relation between e b and the e e b b spectra. Um, we are following uh, just the, the the result from the previous uh, re, uh, just from previous introduced uh, result. Okay, or from this group. So if we take the beta angle uh, of this range, uh, then immediately you get an A initial over F A around uh, one. Um, so as I've said, okay, in, at this point you can certainly raise uh, the the cosine potential. But I think this is like a beyond uh, the precision or the, the statement uh, we are trying to make. But the, uh, we, we don't need extreme hierarchies or uh, squeezing to some, some uh, weird corners of parameter space. Okay, so at last, uh, just to address the previous questions, uh, what if uh, these values, for example, uh, can be directly observed? And I would say uh, definitely, yes, we have developed a lot of skills, uh, just a lot of uh, techniques using AMO physics, for example, uh, atomic clocks to uh, trying to constrain. And uh, nowadays, the constraint uh, are like they translate in terms of uh, electron mass and the, the proton mass because electron mass is changing and the proton mass are coming from QCD. So they are not really sensitive to, uh, to the effect. And the, the current best measurement are coming from the Yibram uh, uh, atomic clock by the uh, observation uh, like say of a time span of order 10 years after just like say doing a bunch of uh, crazy data analysis, you get uh, the current best limit of annual drift of delta mu, uh, which is uh, around 10 to the minus 16.5 um, or 10 to the minus 16, uh, 17 uh, in per year. Uh, this is a very precise measurement and it certainly puts non-trivial constraints on our model. Uh, so, the, currently, anything that's below two times ten to the thirty are like uh, like very unlikely uh, according to our analysis, and uh, except uh, some mechanism or just by chance you are hitting uh, the oscillation phase, like say the the maximum minimum of the axion uh, oscillation. So effectively, the the values are not changing, uh, but but that's fine tuning. Uh, in order to exclude the parameter space up to uh, the meaningful uh, upper upper limit, which is like around the three times ten to the minus twenty nine e, uh, uh, eV, you need a precision of uh, one point five orders of magnitude further. But this could be uh, could be uh, it kind of expected in the in the future decades uh, because of the fast development of the atomic clock fields and also the potential to develop a nuclear clock, which have like a much higher sensitivity and also the sensitivity to uh, strong dynamics. 
Um, here, okay, is actually the slide uh, to answer uh, the question that you can actually point out, uh, just, uh, sorry, you can just point your telescope uh, to outer space. Uh, in that case, you have the global uh, network of, uh, like say, natural constant differences, or like say, just map them. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the amplitude nowadays, even for high Z's are small, like say for the already excluded uh, one times 10 to the minus 30 EB uh, at the Z equals three, uh, it's still quite beyond uh, the current observation. This is like a summarized. The idea is to use the molecular spectra uh, because you different modes like say respond differently to uh, the, the electron mass. And the, therefore you can break the, the degeneracy between redshift and the delta B. But still, current data uh, is not quite enough um, to make a uh, stronger statement. Uh, and I'm not expert for the future extrapolations. Uh, and I'm, I'm, it would be nice to hear from the audience. Is there a way, for, for example, JWST or other telescope can uh, just uh, pin down this? But as far as I know, uh, it is um, quite difficult. Uh, or perhaps increasing the statistics, OK, spending more time uh, measuring uh, the, the distant galaxies would help. So, uh, so far, the, the best limit are still led by atomic clocks. So here I'm just gonna uh, just summarize. Uh, so th there are just two plots uh, coming from the updated results showing you uh, compared to the Lambda CDM, uh, just how the parameter ch changes. And then you can see that uh, Hubble just increases for all kinds of benchmarks. Um, and here is just one uh, example, uh, just like say how these uh, parameters can coexist, uh, indicated by the four evidences together. Um, to summarize, a higher Higgs VEF, or like say uh, something that changes electron mass and the quark mass together uh, at z greater than uh, or around that recombination time, could uh, grant you an early recombination uh, remedy uh, for the Hubble tension. It is possible to make it compatible with BBM and especially the lithium-7. Uh, let's wait and see uh, how it goes. A vanilla axionic solution. So this is, uh, we limit ourselves on like say, uh, just accept axion mass and uh, initial uh, value, uh, just like one or two more effective parameters. And uh, certainly it can go much crazier than this, but uh, with uh, effectively three more parameters, uh, we can see that uh, three or four, okay. More, C even more CDM is predicted. Uh, it's w worsening the, the sigma eight or S eight uh, measurement. So it stays within the line uh, rather than worsening it, which is a common problem. Uh, it naturally explains if there's like a confirmed non-zero ICP uh, by Fringer's effect, uh, still uh, kind of not clear, but uh, it would be interesting. And also, uh, the good thing is uh, it grants us just direct observation chances. So if the nuclear, uh, the atomic clock or nuclear clock uh, just increase or further uh, make a better observation, uh, then uh, the model can be directly tested. So I guess that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Lin Feng. So uh... I'm expecting a lot of questions or it many of them already <laughs> brought up uh, during the talk. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a, it, many, many of these points are quite inspiring because I'm not expert in, in all these uh, fields um, and uh, apologize for some of these, uh, you know, but it would be nice uh, if, you, if you think that some spirit uh, right here uh, could, be, could be helpful. Um, if there's other questions, I will be happy to, to take um, for now. What what is the value of this uh, uh, condensate right now? What is the value of the uh, condensate? Um, so this can be directly read from uh, this plot. It depends on the mass. Um, so you, you can take the initial value, uh, which is of order m Planck or sub m Planck, and then uh, you have the delta v, for example, for ten to the minus twenty eight, uh, twenty nine. This is uh, the amplitude or the amplitude you square it shrinks to 10 to the minus nine uh, level. So you square root at 10 to the minus 4.5. So which means it's like 10 to the uh, 13, 14 GV scale. 
uh, do you have a problem with the fifth force because uh, uh, you have a squared uh, Higgs squared uh, interaction, right? So if mm -hmm. I integrate out yeah. the Higgs, you get uh, we... a squared nucleon uh, nucleon interaction, and then a has a web, right? So so you in principle you have a linear term. Uh, uh, on top of the quadratic, right? It's just uh, excitation above the, the web. So you should have a fifth force as well. Um, this, yeah, I think I'm not, I have to say I'm not, uh, uh, because previous calculation, we do like say some preliminary calculations showing that uh, particle physics wise uh, has almost no uh, conclusions, or oh, sorry, no direct observations available. I think the fifth force can be it's just somehow, uh, like say, understood as this uh, annual drift of electron uh, mass, or like say, a uh, uh, hydronic uh, no, constant. No, no, no. The fifth force here gives you the the uh, renormalization of the Newton potential, right? So, which is also precisely measured. So, uh, it's. Uh, Therefore, it's a question. It, it, it might be that the variation. Of, uh, it depends uh, on the mass scale, right? I mean, just well, I am. I mean, your mass scale is uh, very is low, so. enough, right? So, so it just contributes to a, a Newton potential. You should check whether this is a, it probably smaller than than the. Yeah, I guess it would be small, but it would be nice. Yeah, I would uh, check, and the pos probably there would be something we can do about it. Yes, that's a good point. So in your particle physics model, then mm -hmm. you, you assume that this uh, field is just sitting at some value, which gives you 1% higher VEV. And then w all that happens is that in the late universe, it just goes to its minimum near zero. And then the VEV just drops by 1%. Is that correct? That's the assumption. Yes, it's, uh, it evolves like this way. So initially, it's just 1%. And the over the, the history, that's okay. So at the recombination, at the, the age of recombination, it must stay uh, around right here in order to uh, just like say fit with the CMB uh, without causing more problem. And then mm -hmm. right here is where the observation is kind of uh, weak and then the fast uh, changing uh, areas happens right here. And then nowadays uh, the amplitude is suppressed enough. So uh, there could be ways or better ways to, to measure that. But so far as we know, uh, it's still allowed. Uh, the empty amplitude, yeah. But if I go to the very early universe, then this thing is just coming out of inflation, sitting at some value. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's just yeah. staying there. It's not moving. I mean, why uh, isn't it's it just moving? frozen uh, because of the uh, just the missile or or just uh, the the Hubble equation friction. of motion. Yeah, it Hubble has friction. no time to oscillate because it's just too light. Yeah, I mean the Hubble friction is just keeping it fixed. Is that yeah. is that the idea? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So I have a follow-up question about the axon mass. So even if we accept that the axon mass uh, such a small volume is tuned, but this tuned uh, mass cannot stay constant throughout the evolution of the universe, right? Because the Higgs VEV itself changes. Yeah. Um, so so uh, up to our solution or our, like say, uh, interest, uh, this as long as this happens, uh, I think that this do happen uh, around the BBN moment. Uh, and that that's enough. And we are not discussing uh, the, ev the field evolution uh, prior to that. Is yeah, that... but uh, I'm not worried about the time prior to that. I'm worried about the time after that. So mm -hmm. in the early universe, you assume uh, that this axon, uh, let's say 10 to the minus 29 EV. Mm -hmm. And if the Higgs valve at that point is not the vacuum uh, volume today, then that's fine. You can accept some fine tuning there. But if, as the Higgs valve changes to a slightly bit, then uh, this axon mass becomes huge, which means that the dark matter uh, bond that you assume would not be valid. So you have to. Um, so that's related to my uh, uh, the statement before. So if you stick with this potential, okay, if you stick with the, this potential, you can find an approximate flat direction, which has the 
the same axiom mass, basically the same axiom mass as you, you find. So the evolution is actually following uh, that flat direction and the axiom oscillates and the simultaneously the Higgs potential will also uh, settle down at, uh, or just very slowly changing with axioms. Uh, it's not something that you, you move in this direction and the bounces back and that it's more like a smooth, uh, just going with that direction. So what is compensating the uh, contribution to the axon mass? Uh, so we, it's a, so the, it's a you, you can find that this is a quadratic uh, term, right? I mean, if you just stick with that, okay. So if this is a quadratic term, so uh, which means you can, if this, these two are just somehow the same, right? I mean, or if the solution of axion uh, field and the, the Higgs field are uh, satisfying a certain trajectory, then this potential aside from, okay, there could be some other non-perturbative effect that giving excellent mass, right? That, that's, a, that's a thing that I haven't listed. But the, if you follow that direction, then you, you don't, it's a small change of Higgs map that can, can make uh, the effect explicit. So you're saying that you're assuming some cook up uh, potentials, G and yes. K. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. But, sorry, but this flat direction is not, I mean, it gets lifted by Susie breaking, right? So this direction doesn't survive Susie breaking. That's one of the uh, statement that uh, we, we kind of um, addressed in the previous references. Yeah, and uh, I have to say, this is um, just a possible, a plausible explanation. Um, personally, I have the same doubt as you, but the, for phenomenology, I'm just taking this point. Yes, sir. because look, I mean, you write down a well, super potential. This, this, this uh, flat direction in the end would not survive even the radiative. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. You yeah, this is off just at the GV, one. not even the weak scale, right? So, yeah, yeah, no, 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 that, that's that's true too. But I'm even thinking that even supersymmetry doesn't protect you here. <laughs> because uh, you have to break Susie and it's, it's not going to survive uh, beyond even what you said. Yeah, no, no, I, yeah. Yeah, but the, you can probably imagine some other, other mechanisms. Um, but here I am not uh, fully, okay, taking, okay, or I'm just like taking this as granted, okay, as an input. Okay, this is a linear model, I would say. Uh-huh. Yeah. Is there any um, other questions? Yeah. Mm. If not, uh, let's thank uh, Lin Feng for the nice talk. Thank yeah, you. Thanks uh, for audiences to pointing out so many interesting, um, so many interesting questions. Yeah. Appreciate oh, it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks thank you.